Thanks for coming this morning. It's a privilege to be here with you. It's nice to see you guys all here. And um, We're going to be starting our five-part series on the solas of uh, the five solas. And so uh, what we're going to be doing today is going to be looking at sola scriptura. So let me get us started with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right in. Father, what a blessing to be here this morning. What a blessing to even handle your word and look at your word. How kind of you to give us your word, uh, that we could know you and we could love you. Now, Lord, what a privilege to be able to do that. Lord, we praise you that you are a God who has forfeited your own privacy and you have revealed to us the things that we must know about you, things that explain you and explain us, and you've given it to us in your word. Lord, help us today in your word. Help us to understand your word. Help us to comprehend your word. Lord, for the purpose that when we are done here this morning, we will be ready to uh, serve you and function well in the body of Christ. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, as I mentioned, we're going to be starting our series on the five solas. And really what we want to keep in front of us the whole time here is what is the purpose of the Christian life? And how do we live out that purpose? So what's the purpose of the Christian life and how do we live that out? And the solas actually help us do that. They bring those things into focus for us. Uh, we're going to be looking at sola scriptura today, scripture alone. That scripture alone is our authority for how we must live our lives. But then the rest of the solas also inform us towards that end. They help us understand Christ alone. They help us understand that salvation is through Christ alone. It's through Christ alone by faith, and it's through grace as well, sola gratia, and all of this is for the glory of God. So when you look at all of those things, what you see is what is the purpose of the Christian life? It is the glory of God. How do you do that? You do that by living under the authority of Scripture. You do it by living under the Lordship of Christ. You come to Christ by faith alone and by grace so these things are going to help us understand um, what is the purpose of the Christian life and how we actually live that out. And so today we're going to be looking at the first of those, which is sola scriptura. And we're going to understand that scripture is the sole source of authority for all of life, and particularly for the Christian life. And to do that, we're going to be looking at the teachings of Jesus. And in specifically, we're going to be looking at Jesus' teachings in the Gospel of John, and we're going to even narrow that down for the most part to the upper room discourse in chapters 13 through 17. But because we're going to be looking at Jesus' teaching, we need to remind ourselves of something that we already know. That is that uh, we need to remind ourselves of Jesus' authority. And that authority is going to be testified by a number of things, and the first of which is the Father himself. So if you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 37. And the context here is really important. It's important that we understand that Jesus is in a very heated conversation with some religious leaders. And they have one aim in this conversation, and that is to put Jesus to death. They want to get rid of Jesus, and the way they want to do that is they want to get Jesus to claim to be the Son of God. In verse 37, Jesus is explaining the purpose for him being here. He says, And the Father who sent me has testified of me. The Father has sent me, and he has actually testified of me. We know that at Jesus' baptism, the Father testified of him, and he said this, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Father's testimony is that he himself is pleased with the Son. But it wasn't merely the Father who testified to the Son. It was the Old Testament scriptures. It was the only scriptures that were available at the time, and they testified to the Son all over the place. In that same conversation, Jesus says in verses 46 and 47, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? The Old Testament prophets were looking forward to Messiah Jesus. They were actually looking forward to him. They were pointing to him. And Jesus is saying, um, Moses wrote about me. And what did Moses write? Well, Moses wrote, the Pentateuch. He starts in Genesis 3. This is what Moses wrote. Verse 15, God is speaking to the devil. He's speaking to Satan. And Moses records this. 
God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the, seed, the heel. Moses is writing about Messiah Jesus and his eventual victory over Satan that is coming. A few chapters later in Genesis 12, Moses writes more about Jesus. God is speaking with Abraham. He's giving the Abrahamic promise. He's three verses into the promise. And he says, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is Abraham's descendants. And so the Messiah will come from a, a family line that starts with Abraham. But we need to make sure we don't miss this. It's not just some general blessing. It's the actual specific work of Jesus Christ at the cross and his teaching about himself and his work on the cross. It's through those two things that the nations will be blessed. So we've got the Father's testimony of Jesus. We've got the Old Testament testimony of Jesus. We also have a future Israel testimony of Jesus. This is what future Israel is going to say. Israel from a future point relative to today. Isaiah 53, we know this. This is the testimony of future Israel as they look back and they realize what they did. Verses four and five, future Israel says this. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Old Testament Israel looked at Jesus on the cross. Future Israel looks back and they see themselves looking at Jesus at the cross and they esteemed him smitten of God. They were glad that he was stricken at the cross. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. This is future Israel recognizing that the Messiah, the one at the cross, was the one who died for their sin. So Isaiah describes this. He describes Old Testament Israel, or he, he describes future Israel looking back. So we have three testimonies so far. We also have two other testimonies. We have the testimony of Jesus' works. And this is really important. Jesus is talking about the things that he does and how they attest to him. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 10. We're going to be looking there at what Jesus does and what he says. And again, Jesus is in a heated conversation with religious leaders who want to take his life. And again, what they want him to do is they want to incriminate himself. They want him to say something that will give them reason by which they can put him to death. And so they come to him in, in chapter 10, in verse 24, they gather around him. And this is no friendly gathering. This is a gathering where they are closing in on him and they are encircling him. And they say to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answers them in a really wise way. I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Jesus gives them something they can't deny. He gives them his works. These testify of me. Now, it's important for us to remember that at this time, there was no New Testament. The New Testament didn't, was not existing yet when Jesus was walking in his public ministry. And there were a lot of messages that were floating around in Jerusalem. There was Jesus' message, but it was in competition with lots of other messages. You had the message of the Pharisees. You had the message of the Sadducees. You had the message of the Greeks and the Stoics and everybody else. There were a lot of messages, but Jesus' miracles attested to two things. His miracles attested to the fact that he was indeed the Messiah and that his message was a message that people should be listening to. So we have those testimonies. And lastly, we have the testimony of Jesus himself in John 14. We know this, Jesus is speaking to Thomas and to all the other disciples and he says, I am the truth. I'm the way, I am the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So we have these five testimonies of Jesus, and these are encouraging testimonies. These are good testimonies. These tell us who Jesus is. They tell us that Jesus is authoritative, that his words are authoritative. So with that in mind, we can look at what Jesus tells us about scripture. So again, we're gonna stay primarily in the gospel of John. We're gonna start right there in John 14, and we're gonna see what Jesus says. And what he's gonna be doing is he's gonna be talking about the Holy Spirit. The setting here is the upper room. It's the night before Jesus was crucified. On the front end of that night, the disciples really didn't have any idea that this was going to be their last day with Jesus as they had known things. He is explaining to them that everything is changing. And so when you get to verse 16 in chapter 14, Jesus is telling them that he will provide them with help. 
they're going to need this help. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Notice what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit here. Not only does the Holy Spirit abide with them in verse 16, but what we see in verse 17 is that he will be in you. We're going to see why this is so important. It's because the abiding Holy Spirit that's within them will be the means by which the truth of Scripture is actually conveyed to those men. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. This is not just a general assessment of the Holy Spirit. What this is saying is the Holy Spirit is the one who actually conveys that truth the truth that they are going to record for us and for everybody else who would read it in the days to come. So we have the Holy Spirit's presence in the disciples, but we also have the Holy Spirit's disclosure to the disciples. This is still in John 14. We drop down to verse 26. He gives us more information that helps us understand the role of the Holy Spirit. He says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to remembrance all that I said to you. So it's important that we understand the method of what is taking place here. The method that God's truth is imparted to the disciples. The Holy Spirit will be sent in Jesus' name. And the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance in the disciples all of the things that Jesus actually said to them. So the Holy Spirit will supernaturally convey to the disciples the things that Jesus taught them in his earthly ministry. So that's what's taking place here. It's from the Holy Spirit. Even though the disciples had heard Jesus teaching firsthand, the Father sends Jesus into the world and they receive that teaching, but they weren't ready to carry that message into the world. They, it actually needed to be imparted to them by the Holy Spirit first. It's good to understand what is the origin of this truth. So we're going to back up just a bit to John chapter 7. We've seen this before. Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 16, My teaching is not mine, but it is his who sent me. So the message that Jesus gave to the disciples when they were with him during his public ministry was not his own message. It was from God. It was his who sent me. So we need to look at this and understand this because this is where we see the divine origin of Scripture. The Father gives a message to Jesus. And then he sends Jesus into the world. And Jesus then teaches his disciples. And then the Father sends the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And the Holy Spirit brings that remembrance to the disciples. That was the content of the truth. That is how the truth flowed. It originates from the Father through Jesus to the disciples. Then it's actually disclosed to the disciples by the Holy Spirit. And you see the role that all three members of the Godhead actually have here in the transmission of New Testament truth to the disciples the ones who have become the apostles. And so Jesus gave them the foundations of what they needed to know and believe, and the Holy Spirit was going to impart the rest of it to them. Turn back to John chapter 16, just a couple pages to your right. We're going to look at verses 12 through 15. And Jesus says there is something that's very, very important. That the disciples need to know that there is actually more information that they need. Jesus says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. This is still in the upper room. This is before Jesus takes them out to the Garden of Gethsemane. I have many more things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. This is saying a lot of the same thing. Again, the Holy Spirit is the agency through which the disciples will receive the complete body of information that they need to communicate for the church for all time. He will guide you into all truth. We see that in verse 13. So the immediate thing that was in front of the disciples was Jesus' crucifixion. They were trying to get their mind around that. They were trying to understand that. And that was a huge burden for them. But what they really needed to know beyond that was that they were going to be the ones who were responsible for transmitting the gospel truth to the world. 
but they needed to understand how it was that that truth would be constructed, that they would play a unique role in its authorship. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you, he will take what is mine, and he will disclose it to the disciples. So the disciples really needed to understand what their role is, but they also needed to understand that it wasn't up to them to come up with the truth. The truth would be given to them, and they would spread that news. So you have the Holy Spirit's presence inside of the disciples, and you have the Holy Spirit's disclosure to the disciples. And what we're going to see next, and still in the the upper room discourse, is how the disciples are actually protected. So we're going to see divine protection of those disciples. They've got this immense body of truth, and it's really important that they get this right. So it's important that they actually be protected in that truth. And this is a really great prayer. Jesus is praying, and he starts the prayer by praying for himself for the first five verses. And then he transitions to pray for the disciples, and at the end, he begins to pray for the church to come. And we're right now in the middle of the place where he's praying for the disciples in verse 12. And he's praying to the Father, and he says, While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Here Jesus is actually protecting and guarding the disciples. The Greek word there is to guard and protect. When he says keeping, he means he is standing around them and guarding them and protecting them. And look at how Jesus actually does that, protecting and that keeping. It's in the Father's name. Jesus, what he was protecting was their faithfulness to the truth and who God was. And why was Jesus protecting them? It wasn't primarily to protect them from persecution. He was asking that they would be protected because he knew that they would be the stewards of the gospel truth. And we'll see that when we get to verse 20. Jesus says in in verse 14, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So again, it's the divine origin that we see that the word originates with God. Jesus gives it to the disciples. And how do we know that Jesus gave them the Father's words? Well, the answer is right there. The world actually hated them because they possessed those words. So we know they're from the Father. And so Jesus knew that he had completed the task of his communication to the disciples. And this was an essential step. It was a step that must be completed before the Holy Spirit would come to provide that full disclosure to the disciples. The Holy Spirit would fill out the rest of the framework that Jesus laid the foundation for. And we see again in verse 13, he will guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own initiative, but he will guide you in all truth. And this is important for us to understand at this point. This helps us understand that with the emphasis on the word all, that Jesus had provided the initial disclosure to them, but it was up to the Holy Spirit to communicate the rest of it for them. The Holy Spirit will disclose all of those things. So here is where Jesus gets specific in his prayer request for them in verse 15. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So now the Father is doing the protection. It starts with Jesus protecting at the beginning. Now the Father is going to be protecting. The Father's protection of the disciples. Jesus asks for this because he knows that he's leaving the world and he asks the Father to protect them. And the way that he asks them, to, he asks the Father to protect them is in verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So these men needed to be set apart in holiness of character so that they could actually retain the foundational truths that Jesus gave them and they could receive the full truth from the Holy Spirit that he would disclose to them. So Jesus is, is very concerned about their protection because they are going to be the ones who actually maintain and retain the body of truth that they will write down for the rest of the church, for all of the church age. So let's look at what God's design was for these men once they actually had that truth. And to see that, we'll drop down to verse 20 in chapter 17. This is where Jesus begins to pray for the church, but we'll see the work of the disciples in this. Jesus says in verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who have, will also believe in me through their word. So Jesus is praying for those believers who are to come, those who believe. Jesus is actually desperately concerned that the Father sustain them in their faith. He prays for those who will believe in Jesus through the disciples' word. So now you have the idea that the disciples possess this truth from Jesus, they possess the full truth from the Holy Spirit. 
And now they're actually going to be transmitting that truth. And this isn't just any good word that's spoken. You know, this isn't, when Jesus is not speaking about good conversations and healthy, uplifting conversations between the disciples and other people. He's speaking about the specific gospel message that Jesus gave them, the message that actually saves. That's the word that will give the ability, the ability to the people to actually believe in Christ. And so you see the role of the disciples here. Not only are they to receive from Jesus, they're to receive from the Holy Spirit, but they are actually to take that and to transmit it themselves. But John is doing something really, really important here. He's actually affirming apostolic origin of our Bibles. All who will believe in me through their word. John is speaking about the fact that these guys are going to be receiving the truth and then they're going to be recording the truth and it's going to be there for everybody. And this letter that John is writing is written near the end of John's life. This is written maybe about 10 years before John wrote the book of Revelation. And he had been very, very faithful to his charge as an apostle for probably around 50 years by this time. And at this time, every other New Testament book that was not written by John had been written. So starting with the early books that were written, James and Mark, and moving through all of the rest of the letters, all of the other gospels, Everything else had been written by this time. And and what John is saying is, this is what we have done. This is what we have done. We have actually received from Jesus, his teaching. We actually received from the Holy Spirit, the full truth, all of the truth. And we actually communicated it. Jesus is praying here. John is recording Jesus' conversation with the Father in prayer. And John is saying, this is what we've actually done. I did this. And we want to see what the function is of this teaching that they do. And we see that um, just a little farther on. It brings unity in verse 21, that they may all be one. It brings unity with one another. So through the teaching of the disciples, those who actually believe it will be drawn together. There won't be this splintering of, of belief all over the place. There will be a nucleus of people who hold together the truth and they agree on the truth. So they have unity with one another, but they also have unity with the Godhead. Jesus says, may they also be in us. It's hearing the truth from the disciples that gives them unity with the Godhead. Verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. So Jesus is affirming right there in his prayer that the disciples understand that the Father sent Jesus into this world to start that chain of communication, communication that he gave to them, that the Holy Spirit would finish in them, that they would send to the rest of the world. So this tells us a lot about Scripture. This tells us an awful lot about Scripture. And what I want to do is walk through eight or ten different things that this helps us understand about Scripture. As we think about what Jesus has been teaching here, This tells us some things about Scripture that we just can't miss. The first thing that we we can't miss about Scripture is the necessity of Scripture. We see that back in John 5. Truly I say to you, John 5, 24, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. And he does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. It is essential that a person hear the word of truth in order to have saving faith because the word alone has the power to take a person out of spiritual death and bring them into spiritual life. So the word itself is necessary for salvation. A person must hear the true gospel and believe it. There is no other thing that a person can hear that will save them. The gospel itself is the power of God unto salvation. So the first thing we need to take away about Scripture today is its necessity for salvation. When we pray about salvation for the lost around us, whether it's in our family or it's anywhere else, what we need to be praying for is that they actually understand the truth of Scripture. That when we put Scripture in front of them, that they actually can believe that. This tells us something else about Scripture that I think is very, very important for us to know. And that is that there is a continuity to Scripture. A continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Again, in that same chapter, John chapter 5, verse 46, we looked at this. Jesus said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. 
So here we have Moses, 14, 1500 years, whatever, before Christ. He's writing about Christ. He's writing precision, precise truth about Christ. And John expects his readers to know their Old Testaments. He expects them to understand the content of what was in their Old Testament. Because Jesus fulfills Moses' teaching, he doesn't actually replace Moses' teaching. He fulfills it. And so it wasn't like the Old Testament could stand on its own or the writing that would come that the disciples would capture and, and then distribute to the world, that that could stand on its own. There was a continuity of message from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we see that in John's gospel and we see that in all the other gospels as well. Uh, Matthew's gospel starts with a genealogy. It's a genealogy that um, comes to Jesus from Abraham. It moves forward. Luke's gospel contains another genealogy from Jesus back through Abraham all the way to Adam through Mary's family line. So you have two genealogies in your New Testament that show you how it is that Jesus came from the Old Testament. We, uh, we know from Mark chapter 1 that there's an awful lot of continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In chapter 1, John the Baptist is being recorded and is, is speaking about that very continuity. Jesus, uh, John the Baptist says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. John the Baptist is quoting the words of Isaiah as he's describing Jesus coming to him, seeing Jesus. Isaiah wrote 700 years earlier and John the Baptist is recording what Isaiah wrote. So there's this continuity. And then when Jesus appears, he says, in, and John says in chapter 1, verse 29, behold the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. That idea of the Lamb of God taking away the sin originated in the Old Testament. And John says, here he is. This is the one who does this. So the same message of the Old Testament that the Messiah is coming, it's completed, it's finished, it's filled in full detail in the New Testament. And so God gives us these two Testaments, one that describes Jesus and pictures him coming and the other that actually shows him coming. We actually see it. So it's important that we understand the continuity of Scripture. This is really important, but it's also important that we understand the inspiration of Scripture. And what we see here is that Scripture actually originates with God. And this is a, a belief that is unique to Christian faith, is that the deity of the Christian faith is the one who actually communicates his truth. He communicates it to his people himself. He actually communicates what he believes and what is true about him. And so this is the foundational doctrine of scripture is that it originates with God himself. These are God's words. And again, in John chapter 14, verse 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance what I said to you. So it's God's own words that are breathed out into the mind of the authors by divine inspiration. These aren't man's ideas. This is not a council of people getting together and, and writing out a creed or a confession. And this is God communicating his truth through his Holy Spirit into the mind of a human author who writes down his words and then God preserves those words in the original language and allows it to be translated for us. And when you read your Bible, you see a cohesiveness to it. The, the Bible is written over the course of about 1,500 years with, with many, many, many authors. It's written at different times. It's written in different places. And this cohesiveness could not come about if it was not inspired by the one and same Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that was working the men in the Old Testament was at work in the men in the New Testament. And John's account is in perfect accord with what the rest of the scriptures teach about Jesus. We see what, what John says about Jesus is the same thing about what Peter says about Jesus and what Paul says about Jesus. When John is writing about the inspiration of Holy Spirit here in John chapter 14, he's saying the same thing that, that Paul wrote in 2 Timothy to Timothy when Timothy was teaching in the church in Ephesus. He says all scripture is inspired by God. So that's Paul's testimony that all scripture is inspired by God. And Peter also writes the same thing in 2 Peter 1, 21. He says, no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by this Holy Spirit spoke from God. So you have this collective testimony that God himself inspired the words that we read 
So when we read our Bibles, we're not reading, we know this, but we're not reading the thoughts of man. We're reading God's very own thoughts because God is a communicating God. So it's important that we understand the inspiration of Scripture, but it's also important that we understand that because Scripture is inspired, it's inerrant. We need to understand Scripture's inerrancy. Whenever we read anything else, we know that it is subject to error. Um, I spent 32 years in the engineering field, and there were lots of things that changed over the course of those 32 years. But Scripture never changes. This is what John writes in chapter 14. I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper that he may be with you. That is the spirit of truth. It's important to understand that that the Holy Spirit's work was that he would guide us in all truth. He would guide those disciples in that. And that inerrancy flows out of this inspiration. God is inerrant in who he is. He has no error within himself. He's completely right in all that he does. So he's inerrant in what he thinks. And because he's inerrant in what he thinks, he's inerrant in what he communicates. So he thinks truth and he gives that truth to Jesus. Jesus speaks that same truth to the disciples. The disciples record that. The Holy Spirit affirms that same truth and discloses that to them. It's very important that we understand that this is truth. There is no other location. There's no other locus for truth itself. And this is why the Holy Spirit is designed, uh, described as the, the spirit of truth because the words had their origin in the Father himself. And so it's important for us to understand that, that God would not allow the humans to introduce error as they're writing down the original scriptures. And the reason why we see that is that that's why God gave the Holy Spirit as the means of inspiration. So what they would write down was actual truth, the truth from God. It wasn't that these men were taught somehow and they had to derive this themselves. They actually received the words of truth and they wrote those down. And these men knew they were weak and, and Jesus spoke these words so that they would men, these men would know that the content was not up to them, that the content would be given to them. They just be, had to be faithful men to record it. They recorded it with their own personality and their own nature, but the words themselves were from God. So it's important that we understand also that in addition to being inerrant, we need to understand the authorship of Scripture. And God's design from the beginning was that we would have dual authorship. And this is important for us to see. We see that in John chapter 15. When the helper comes, he will testify about me. So we have the Holy Spirit's testimony. And then in verse 27, you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. So they have a message, but it wasn't just their message. It was a message that was actually supervised by the Holy Spirit. And so you have this human authorship and you have this divine authorship. And they're really not in contention. They're not in conflict with one another at all. So here they are in the upper room discourse and Jesus' words are those of the Father. And again, he gives those to the disciples. And the disciples are going to receive those words and then have the Holy Spirit disclose that to them. And then they're going to communicate that. You have this truth that comes from God. And then each man with his own personality and his own unique gifting writes the words that God gave to them. And it's important for us to ask ourselves one question, and that is this. How do we know that these disciples, these fallen men, these weak men, did not actually corrupt the true message? How can we be sure that when, when they were given the task of actually capturing New Testament truth and recording it, that they didn't actually corrupt it in that process. Well, the answer is right there for us in verse 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father gives them, he will teach you all things and he will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. He puts the actual truth right into the mind of the men who are going to write it down. There was no possibility for men to get it wrong because the Holy Spirit put it in their mind. They didn't have to come up with it on their own. So these are not in conflict with one another. God is using the Holy Spirit to inform these men and disclose to these men. And then these men are writing with their own personality the words that Jesus gave them. And a good way for us to see that is if any two of us were watching the same event and then we took two separate pencils and two separate sheets of paper and we sat down and we described the event, we would be describing the same event. We would be describing the same course of actions but we would use our own words. We would use our own personality. We would have our own vocabulary, but it would be describing the very same truth. 
people who are reading those two accounts would come to the same conclusion. They would understand the same truth. There might be a little bit more information about one aspect of it from one writer. And there might be a little bit more information from another aspect from another writer, but they're recording the same thing, and we could see that. That's what's taking place in our Bibles when we read our New Testaments in simplified form. So we can see the authorship of Scripture, but it's also good to see that we have the authority of Scripture. This is something that's so helpful in our world today. We need to understand that, that when we hold our Bible in our hands, we're actually holding authoritative truth. It's not just truth, it's truth that has authority in it. Scripture has authority because its origin is from God. It's important that we know that. And as it relates to authority, God makes no distinction between who he is on one hand and what he says on the other. They're one and the same. They contain the same authority. God himself has authority, and so what he says has authority. And the Bible is an extension of God's divine character. And what that means is that it's an accurate portrayal of who God really is. And so scripture possesses inherent authority because God himself has that same inherent authority. So it's good to know that when we sit down and we've got a reading plan and we're reading our Bibles, that we're reading something that is authoritative. And we can get used to that and maybe we've been reading our Bibles for 30, 40, 50 or more years. But it's important for us to remind ourselves freshly as often as we can, this is the authoritative truth. It will never change. Then there's this idea that scripture is also described by a canon, the canonicity of scripture. And this is important for us to understand because what this speaks of is the closure of scripture, the containment of that truth. And it's important for us to see that scripture actually teaches about its own closure. The full content of scripture is what Jesus taught the disciples in the New Testament scriptures is what the Jesus taught the disciples in his New Testament ministry and what the Holy Spirit would reveal to those same disciples. John 15, 26, when the helper comes, he will testify about me. This is a clear indication that there's more to come. And again, Jesus, we, we looked at this earlier. He says in chapter 16, I have more things to say to you. But it's important for us to understand that when Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. That means there's going to be an end point for the truth. That is, when the Holy Spirit has communicated the last bit of truth, that is it. That is the last of the content of the New Testament that was going to be recorded for us. And so the question here is we want to make sure we understand and we get right is who it is that um, is, going to be re is going to be guided with that truth. And it's actually the apostles themselves. He will guide you into all truth. So you have this apostolic origin here, and you have the fact that the disciples themselves are the one that hear the truth. So God communicated the message of the New Testament exclusively to the New Testament authors. And this is where we see a very clear statement about apostolic authority. God is saying, these are the men to whom I am going to communicate the truth, and they will record it for me. But to the point of the canon, this means that there's an end to it. Jesus is saying there's more coming and you'll get it. And when it comes to you, that is all that there will be. There will be no more. Because those are the men who are going to receive the truth. So when those men pass off of the scene, uh, the mechanism for passing on that truth has come to an end and God has indeed communicated all this truth because he's communicated it to them. And when we get back to John chapter 17, we see the point of these people. And we see the point of that communication expressly to those disciples. Because Jesus says, I don't ask on behalf of these alone, but those who will believe in me through their word. There refers to the disciples, the men who would become the apostles. And look at what this implies. This implies that if the disciples were responsible for communicating all truth, then the canon itself must be concluded. It must be closed with the disciples and those men. So the only way to understand Jesus' words is that there is a finite body of New Testament revelation that's coming. And when that is revealed, the scriptures are complete. So scripture describes its own closure. And that's very important for us to understand that when we read our Bibles, we're reading all of the truth. There is no more truth beyond that. But we also need to understand that the sufficiency of scripture, this is something that's very helpful for us to understand. And again, we're using some of these verses for several different purposes. 
But Jesus says, when he comes, he will guide you in all truth. There is, there is no need for any other source of truth. The truth that you get is the scriptures. The guidance that comes from the Holy Spirit is the body of truth. It's sufficient for all things. We're going to depart from Jesus' teaching just a bit here. I want us to write down Psalm 138, verse 2. The psalmist writes there and he says, You have magnified your word according to all of your name. You've magnified your word according to all of your name. So this is telling us the place that scripture really has. God has put scripture at the same level as his own name. That tells us something about scripture. Scripture is competent to address our issues in life if it is given a place right next to God's name. Second Peter chapter 1, we know this. This is a great passage, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellent. Scripture is whoa, sufficient it contains the resources necessary for us to live our lives in a way that is pleasing to God. So when we have Scripture in front of us and we're living our lives according to the truth of Scripture, that gives us everything we need to live a life that is holy and pleasing to God. Scripture doesn't address every possible scenario in life, and we know that. We see that. You don't find a chapter and verse that covers every single scenario you can imagine that's taken place in your life. But the principles contained in Scripture give you the wisdom that you need and they will guide you through that situation in life. So those are some really important things we need to understand about Scripture. Nine different principles for us. And it's good for us to have some points of application here as we think about this. If we think about this whole idea of God and how he actually communicated the New Testament to the disciples, starting with Jesus teaching of them, the Holy Spirit's disclosure of that same truth, and then them propagating that truth to us. It's important for us to think about what that means for us. When we consider this, uh, the first application for us is we need to be reading our Bibles. If you're not reading your Bible, you need to ask yourself, why not? This is divine truth. This is all of the truth. This is the only truth. So we need to be people who are reading our Bibles and reading them carefully. But we also need to be reading all of our Bibles. When we think about um, all of Scripture, our Bibles have several hundred, sometimes more than a thousand pages, depending on your font size and the notes at the bottom and so forth. But it's important to understand that God has revealed his character to us in the pages of Scripture. So if we want to know all about God, we need to read all of God's revelation to him. In our New Testaments, it's, it's important for us to read 3 John and Philemon as it is for us to read any other page in our New Testaments. And Second Chronicles and Malachi are there for reason, because they reveal an aspect of God's character that we're not going to get on other pages. They complete that revelation for us. So we need to make sure we're reading all of our Bibles. And if you don't have a reading plan, I encourage you to get one. Um, if you're in Build or Wellspring, you can find different reading plans are available. Um, if you want to build your own reading plan, one that works for you, that takes you through the full counsel of Scripture, do that. But come up with some way so that over the course of your life, you'll be reading the full counsel of Scripture again and again and again. There is nothing that can aid you more than a constant, steady taking in of God's truth every day and then applying that to your life. This also has implications for us in lots of other areas. It has implications for us in our sanctification. When we're seeking to grow in our sanctification, we know that Philippians 1 tells us that God is committed to finishing the work that he began in us, and he will do that. But we have in front of us the testimony here that Jesus tells us, sanctify the disciples in the truth. Your word is truth. And he was speaking specifically about their sanctification and their task. But by extension, the same thing is true for us. We are sanctified in God's truth. When we have the truth of God's word in our mind, we apply that to our heart. God uses that and we apply that. God uses that to sanctify us and grow us in a life that's more holy and holy. So God's word is going to be the basis for our sanctification. 
We have great fellowship. We have great reading, extracurricular reading, all kinds of other things. But God's word itself needs to be the foundation for our sanctification. It's important for us to think about the role that scripture has in our conversations with one another. God has a design for the body, and we know this from Ephesians chapter 4, that the body causes the growth of the body, and it does that by each individual piece working together according to its proper design, and each one of those pieces is supplying to the other pieces. But think about what it is that you supply to one another when God, um, when you're in conversation with people that actually causes growth, it's truth. It's things that are, it's encouragements, it's words of exhortation, it's words of comfort that have their source of origin in God's word. So I just wanna encourage all of us to think about how we can grow in the ability to take God's truth and bring it to bear in our conversations. Ways that we can encourage one another from God's word when we see things in another person that are so commendable and so encouraging or so exemplary for us. Tie that back to God's word, and in so doing, strengthen that person and strengthen yourself. I think of Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. I I love this verse. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. God has given us the opportunity to communicate with one another, and we have lots of great conversations. But what he's telling us here is, We do all of these things, teaching, admonishing, our conversations with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with truth from God's word. It's very important for us to remember as well what bearing scripture must have on our thought life. It's so easy, and I I need to work on this so much myself, to just slide it into neutral spiritually when I'm on my own and not really shepherd my thoughts and guide my thoughts. I love Psalm 119. Psalm 119 tells me so much about God's word and how his word is helpful to me on a daily, hourly, moment by moment basis. I love verse 24 in Psalm 119. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Nothing offers more comfort. Nothing offers more refinement. Nothing offers a sweeter fellowship than than meditating on the truth of God's infallible word. Nothing. When I'm concerned about something that is coming up, when I'm worried about something, when I've got a situation that clearly is beyond my control, God's testimonies are the thing that brings me delight, that bring me joy, that bring me counsel in all that I do. Another area that's very, very helpful for us an implication from all of these truths about the souls of scripture relates to our repentance. Now, every believer knows that God is in the process of sanctifying us. And that means that we have opportunities on a daily basis to turn from sin. But what I want to encourage us to do this morning that's so important for us to consider and think through very carefully is how it is that we actually repent from sin. What is the basis for our repentance from sin? It's truth from God's word. We know this, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is useful for correcting and training in righteousness. If there's an area of sin in your life that you know you need to get rid of, you know you're working on, one of the things that's most helpful for us to understand in all of this is that we need to bring the power, the authority, the truth, the content of Scripture to bear on whatever it is that we're turning from. We need to understand what Scripture tells us about what God thinks about that sin. But then we need to understand what Scripture tells us about what God has done to, re- to protect us and to save us from the consequence of that sin. And the truth of scripture is what encourages us in our repentance. When we're repenting, we can see God's promises. It helps us to understand that that our sin doesn't characterize us. What characterizes us is God's love for us and his promise that he's not finished with us, his promise that, that he will complete the work that he began in us. So when we repent from our sin and we're using scripture as our basis for it, it helps us to think rightly about what we've done. It helps us to think rightly about God's provision for us in it. It helps us to think rightly about where we're going. So it's important for us to think carefully about our repentance. And the last thing that's important for, and that's for the leadership of this church, is the solos of scripture speak so clearly into our preaching. Our scriptures and our teaching here always need to stand on the truth of scripture. 
we need to understand that the Holy Spirit has completed his revelation to the church. And so this is what we have. When we get up here, we have our Bibles. We want to be men who preach the truth of God's word. And the conviction of the elders at this church is that we want that to be characteristic of us. We want that always to be characteristic of us. Is that when you, you come to church here on a Sunday morning, you will hear the teaching of God's word. One of the things that's, that's very, very sobering in this world is that it's hard to find churches that are faithful, true churches, generation after generation after generation. And what is characteristic of churches that may have a good start, but, but fall off and become unfaithful is that they quit teaching the word. They start finding other things that are attractive, other things that, that are used to draw people into the word. And here at this church, we want to remain faithful to just teaching the word to feeding you with the, the truth that you will always hear, that you need, that you'll always need. And so these are the things that we think are important. These are the things that, that tell us that God has given us scripture. He has revealed himself to us. It guides us in all of these ways. It's necessary. The Old Testament continues into the New Testament. We have lots of good things in the New Testament that help us understand things. We are people who must use this and we must use it well. We must use it right. So my encouragement to you is keep reading your Bibles, read all of your Bibles, use your Bibles as you repent from sin, use your Bibles in your conversations, use your Bibles in your sanctification, use your Bibles to guard your thought life and all of those things. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its truth. I thank you for what you have done to give us your word. Lord, how encouraging it is that you are a revealing God. Or that you haven't left it up to us to figure out who you are. You have been clear and you have been plain with us in giving us your word. Lord, I thank you that you have preserved your word. I thank you that we have good translations of your word today. That good men have labored hard to give us accurate translations of your truth in our language. I pray for us, Lord, that we would esteem your word. Because in doing that, Lord, we esteem you. We put it in a high place. Lord, I pray for us that your word would continue to have a place of authority. It would continue to have a place of influence in our lives so that we would be people who are faithful to you. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.